Hello and welcome to this not quite live Q&A session for the launch of the Cubicity course. My name is Kent Trammell, I'm the instructor, and we typically like to do these live so that you can get your questions answered in real time. Um, but I couldn't quite guarantee that I would be available at this time and I'm very sorry for that. But I still think it's going to be informative and if you do have questions that I didn't think of ahead of time, please ask them in the chat below. We should have a CG Cookie crew member or two there to hopefully answer where uh, I cannot. And uh, I appreciate you watching this format. I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Uh, number one, first and foremost, for the clarification, in case anything is unclear from the teaser or trailer videos or the course landing pages. Um, if you're interested in learning from this course, this type of Q&A session should clarify um, anything before you invest in the course. And also there's a second reason that's a, a little more personal in that, you know, as instructors, we live and breathe these courses for months at a time. And uh, it's a kind of a personal journey, you know, where the idea will evolve and uh, either expand or contract. Uh, sometimes, you know, Blender features are added in the middle of the course, making things awkward. But uh, in answering these questions, often the more personal side of course production will come out. And I find there being a sense of closure in that. So thank you for joining me here. Without further introduction, let's get into the first question. The idea for Cubicity was a pretty straightforward exploration of the asset browser. I wanted that to be the key focus of the course. And if we rewind back to the beginning of 2022, I had just released the human course, which took two years to produce. So I was interested in scaling down, doing a much smaller course. And so initially I thought I might reuse assets from a different project. That certainly would have made production go quicker. Um, but as I was researching other tutorials on YouTube and trying to see what other people were teaching and also understand the tool myself, um, I started to realize that a lot of people were using those pre-made asset libraries to simply focus on the asset browser. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, it makes complete sense, but I find myself asking questions like, well, how should the assets be constructed with the intention of being incorporated into the asset browser? And then I realized I just need to teach that from the very beginning, creating assets from scratch, incorporating them into the asset browser, and then assembling them into the final scene. And so reusing assets is kind of boring anyway. And all of a sudden the project expanded to this new style, which I'd never done before. And that's the isometric kind of adorable city, which I've always had a soft spot for. And uh, the project became really exciting at that point. It grew in scope beyond what I expected, but that also makes it fun. And it was that needed spark of passion that I'm always looking for whenever I teach because I think that passion is contagious and an important part of what makes a good Blender course, in my opinion. And so in the end, it wasn't just about the asset browser. In fact, in all honesty, the asset browser is a pretty small part of the course. It's an important part, but it's a much broader workflow spanning asset creation, material creation, scene planning, assetizing, of course, and then assembling the final product. And so it started small, evolved, and became something much more exciting, if you ask me. So this is something else I'm pretty excited about the course. It's one of those really rare examples where I truly believe all skill levels can engage meaningfully in this project, which again, I can say for very few other courses. And it's mostly due to that simplistic isometric style, which is extremely easy to approach from an asset creation standpoint. Seriously, the course starts with building a street lamp and it's so simple that I really believe someone can model this on their first day using Blender right? It's all primitive based, you know, buildings are square, simple operations, extruding, cutting edge loops, all that stuff is very approachable from a beginner. Now we don't go over the user interface from a beginning standpoint, but if you watch the Blender Basics course and if you need more like the mesh modeling fundamentals, then you will have no problem building these assets from the start. And then naturally the course kind of progresses into an intermediate level in terms of concepts with modularity, uh, both making models that can tile together as well as the textures, uh, procedural textures, be seamlessly populated across the surface. And then in terms of material creation, it's not crazy complex, but it's also not, 
you know, your beginner type materials. So that's very much intermediate level. And then it progresses into advanced concepts when we get into geometry nodes for the parametric building, as well as some randomizing techniques in the materials that are more uh, advanced. But in a broad sense, if you want to engage with this project and contribute assets to the library, which we'll talk more about, if you're a beginner, you can focus on simpler assets. There's plenty of those to go around. If you're more advanced, you can create some advanced systems, right? Like you can conceptualize a subway system, for example, and build that out and contribute it, or just create more complex buildings and both skill levels and everything in between would have a lot of fun if you ask me. In a way, let's think of CG Cookie membership as a school setting, right? Where tuition is the membership. And whenever you are a member, you have access to everything CG Cookie offers. Uh, all of our courses, as well as access to instructors where we pay attention to questions. We also grade exercises. And you're also rubbing shoulders with peers who are learning the same things as you are. And as a company, we strive to make this a comprehensive learning ecosystem. Whereas whenever we sell a course on the Blender market, we refer to it as a standalone purchase. That is for people who want to learn from the course on their own. They don't need an instructor presence to clarify questions that they have. They just need the videos. So in practical terms, it comes down to how you learn best. If you find yourself asking a lot of questions while you watch a course, why did you use this technique? Why did you use this tool? Hey, does anyone else have trouble with this part of the workflow? You're going to get answers through cgcookie.com membership, be it from instructors or instructor assistants or fellow peers. I would highly recommend the membership if that's how you learn. On the other hand, if you don't really find yourself needing to ask clarifying questions, then maybe the Blender Market purchase is best for you. But I really want to stress the standalone nature of that. The customer support we offer for our courses on the Blender Market is limited to making sure you can download the videos properly, you can unzip them, you can play them, you can set up the subtitles properly. Everything you need to begin watching the course, that is what we answer questions about. But as far as the learning material, Blender Market customers are on their own in that way. There's no student-teacher relationship facilitated there. This course is entirely rendered with Eevee. It's sort of the perfect project for Eevee, honestly. Since the style is so simplistic, our polygon counts are really low, and our materials aren't terribly complex, but more importantly, we're reusing a small number of materials broadly across the scene, so it's optimized in that way. And Eevee responds in real time throughout the course. Granted, I have a RTX 2080. If you've got a lower end graphics card, it might not be so snappy. But at least with a 2080, you know, it's buttery smooth. Until we get to the nighttime scene, which does feature more light objects. Speaking of... Yes, we do cover both. It didn't start that way. When I was R&Ding the course, it was all daytime. But then as I started recording the course, again, the first asset we build is a lamppost. And the idea occurred to me that wouldn't it be neat if we could fairly easily switch between daytime and nighttime. That'd be kind of cool. I was daydreaming about it throughout the first chapter, and then I finally made it a goal, and we do end up teaching the nighttime as well. And uh, so there's some fun you know, mechanisms involved in teaching that. And so I am proud to say we do daytime and nighttime lighting. It's pretty good, certainly competent, I'd say. Um, it is early in the features development, so it can only get better. And uh, I do think there's room for improvement. But um, throughout the course, you'll see me run into some quirks here and there. But uh, thankfully, um, there was a show-stopping moment kind of early in the R&D where I had created a few assets and I was practicing assetizing them. And, you know, the way I build assets is often as separate objects. I rarely collapse something like a building down to one object because I'll you know, make the walls out of its own object, the roof will be its own object, the windows, you know, that kind of thing. But way back in, I don't know, March, maybe late February, you couldn't set collections as assets. And that was kind of a show-stopping issue because it meant you had to collapse everything down into one object so that it was very destructive 
And I remember reaching out to uh, Julian Casper about it, specifically if they were using it on um, the latest short film production. And he said it was hard to use because they couldn't set assets as collections yet. So conveniently, it wasn't maybe two or three weeks later before collections could be added as assets. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. The course continued. And you know, at this point, I think the asset browser is very competent, room for improvement, just like everything in Blender. Since we live in the era where literal magic is being achieved with geometry nodes being posted all across social media, it only makes sense to expect that maybe everything I did in the course is geometry nodes, right? Well, I don't mean to disappoint, but there's actually very little geometry nodes in the course. Uh, the only thing that utilizes that tool is the parametric building. So the roads aren't generated with geometry nodes, the population of the buildings and assets, that's not geometry nodes either. So why? Why did I not do more with geometry nodes? Well, I'm just like you, I'm absolutely blown away by what people are doing with geometry nodes. But creating with geometry nodes is a radically different way of creating things in general. It's very mathematical, it's very programmatic. Um, someone recently called it visual programming and that's exactly what it is. And if your mind works that way, it's awesome. If you're a little more craft oriented, like to work with your hands, then it's not gonna be so intuitive. And so I much more prefer the hands-on approach compared to the fully generative approach. I anticipate this might disappoint some people, but keep in mind there is hype and there is reality. And even though Geometry Notes has all the hype behind it, generative modeling is amazing and awesome. It's not gonna be for everyone and that's okay. It does not discount the conventional methods by any stretch, trust me. And that's all I want to say about geometry nodes for now. Okay, so this is going to need some explanation. I would estimate about 95 or more percent is real time and 5% or less is sped up. Now, let me explain what I mean. Um, I believe in real time courses. The first course I ever recorded was recording the video separately, fast forwarding that later, and then recording commentary over top of that. And uh, I realized that so much of the workflow, little intricate details and decisions that I'm making while I work was forgotten by the time I got to commentary. So it made for a very lackluster commentary. It was a, it was a terrible course in terms of educational meat, I would say. And so from that point on, I realized that's just not the way I'm gonna teach well. And so I've always recorded in real time, meaning I'm recording commentary plus demonstration at the same time. So that's how this course is. However, I have a dirty secret about how I like to use time-lapse. Um, when I'm recording myself demonstrating something, it always takes longer than if I was executing a task without having to explain it. So whenever I'm editing, sometimes I will notice something took 30 seconds to demonstrate and commentate at the same time. Then when I get to editing, I realize that the commentary for that 30 seconds has a lot of gaps in it or I'm fumbling to find the right words. And so I can cut that down um, to maybe 15 seconds. And then that will allow me to speed up the video to 200%. So the video is sped up but my dirty secret is I crop out my head and keep the audio in real time. All right, so that's how I can optimize the teaching. All right, so it's not raw real time, but the education is still real time. And the reason I do this is I'm always trying to win the battle as much as possible against attention span, right? It's 2022, we're learning through the internet. I know that that's a battle, so I'm always trying to decrease the duration of a course and um, preserve the educational real-time nature of it. So that's one technique I use to compress and optimize the information. Now, what I like to think of this is my courses have a compressed value, right? You're getting more value in less time than if it was completely real-time. Um, if you notice it, let me know. I'll be surprised because no one's ever mentioned it in a comment that they, they notice me doing it. Um, the only other time I use time-lapse is in extremely repetitive tasks. 
So in one instance in the course, I can remember off the top of my head, whenever I populate the city, um, you know, I place 15 buildings by hand, let's say, you kind of get the idea. You don't need me to place the remaining 10 or whatever, or and that's just one block of a four block diorama. So in that example, I will usually opt to either um, just say I'll finish the rest off screen or say um, I will finish the rest of the repetitive task as a time lapse and you can watch it or you can skip it. Um, so I'm very adamant about not time lapsing important things. And if there's a time lapse, it's um, because I've taught it in real time already. So anyway, that's a long way of explaining. Yes, it's a real time course, but technically there is some time lapse involved. Okay, so the community contribution portion of the course is maybe what I'm most excited about. We've never done something like this before. We've um, always had exercises, which we see as opportunities for uh, CG Cookie members to apply what they learn, submit it as an exercise and get graded and get feedback from instructors or instructor assistants. And so this community contribution is kind of a bigger version of that exercise. And it's designed for members, so it's limited to member participation. If you purchase from the Blender Market, you won't be able to contribute. Again, going back to the learning ecosystem, student-teacher relationship, this uh, exercise, this contribution is designed to facilitate further engagement with our members. So it only makes sense that it's restricted to their involvement. And uh, if you really want to be a part of it, consider investing in a CG Cookie membership. We're releasing the library as public domain, CC0, no strings attached. And I'm also very excited about this because it means anyone can use this for any purpose. So maybe we'll see it used in a commercial one day. Maybe we'll see it used as assets in a game, maybe some sort of VR something. And so over the years, it will just become more and more valuable, more and more unique and uh, something really cool, kind of giving back to the community. So I do have a plan for this, but since we've never done it, it's subject to changing. But I think what's realistic is, let's say I get a handful of submissions each week. I can grade the submissions pretty soon after they're submitted at a weekly basis. But as far as assimilating and updating the library file, I'm planning on only doing that once a month because you know the assimilation process is pretty involved. Uh, to ensure you know consistency and uh, that's probably going to take an entire day so I'm imagining like an assimilation day maybe at the end of a month where I incorporate all the submitted assets that have been approved update the file on um, the download page and so each month we can expect a new version of that file okay so that's all the questions I could imagine you asking but um, hopefully things are clarified about the course. And if you have further questions, don't hesitate to connect on Discord, send an email to support at cgcookie.com, reach out to me on Twitter at khtremel. On the Blender Market, you can ask questions before buying. And uh, if you're a CG Cookie member, I really hope I'll be grading your submission soon. Thank you for watching, have a good rest of your day.